Yo, what's up, what's up everyone? Mike Hill, the Wholesaling Titan here. And in today's video, I'm answering uh, a question from the survey that I told you guys about on my last video. Um, so the question is, Mike, if I have $1,000 to get started with, what should I spend it on? Um, and I get similar questions to this, so I'm gonna modify just a little bit to be, you know, what if I'm starting with absolutely nothing or a couple hundred bucks, you know, up to $1,000. Um, I could go really deep on this, but for the sake of time and to try and do this in just one video, I'm going to try and give you a general overview without getting overly specific. But you guys know uh, my goal with my videos is to really try to give you some tangible, actionable advice that you can start putting into practice. Um, so I'm going to be sure to do that as well. Um, so first off, to the person that submitted this question, I have seen several of your messages. We've talked before, um, seen your comments. And so I really want to thank you for engaging. And I want you to know that despite the naysayers, that this is 100% possible for you and for everyone. Um, and it looks like based on a timeline that you have been working at this for some time now, um, and I'm sure a lot of you might be in the same boat. I mean, if you're completely new, welcome. Um, but I think a lot of you have been paying attention and learning and watching the videos, um, in some cases maybe for months, and it's just kind of not working. And so you might wonder like, like, damn, like what am I doing wrong? Like where's the missing piece? When is this going to work? Um, and look, you know, I talk a lot about how this business changed my life. And, um, you know, you might see some of the good stuff. But I want you to know, like, I, I didn't start that way, man. I was living in South Dakota not too long ago. I was making $39,000 a year. Wasn't going anywhere. I decided to just pick up and move to Florida without a plan. Like, complete blank slate, man. I had no job, no job prospects. You know, I had the $600, no car, no apartment. Um, I was a grown man and I moved into a room at my grandmother's house. So if you want to talk about a massive ego blow <clears throat> and then on top of it, you know, it wasn't just me. I had a family of three to support. Um, and in those days, man, I had to borrow money from my parents just to buy diapers and food. Um, and it was a really rough time, man. Um, my grandmother's awesome. Couldn't have done it without her. Um, but I knew I was kind of imposing and I wanted to be in a position to help my family and not be a burden on that. And then keep in mind, I went to a I went to Duke University, a pretty elite school, and so I saw my peers and people I graduated with working on Wall Street and traveling and buying new Beamers and Audis and invited me to travel, and, and I was literally getting my debit card declined at McDonald's. It's a true story. It happened to me uh, a couple times. Um, so because of that, at that time, I knew that I wanted to make money, and I wanted to pay back my grandma and my parents, um, and I did end up getting a job, a nine-to-five. I was making $50,000 a year. <clears throat> And around that time, something else clicked for me. Um, and at that time, you know, I was borrowing a car and I was driving two hours from Palm Beach to South Beach. I was working a 10 hour day and then driving two hours home. And so the two things I realized is that number one, I, I can't call another person boss, man. I, I'm just not good with the order taken and uh, I'll just leave it at that. It's just a personal thing, not for me. Uh, but number two, I was gone for minimum 14 hours a day. Um, and, and coming home exhausted, and my daughter was asleep half the time, you know, by the time I got home, and I would be gone before she woke up, and, and I was just living to work, um, and I remember growing up, my dad was in a, a similar predicament, I mean, awesome dad, awesome provider, supportive, and all that, but five days a week, you know, he was working to support our family, and uh, I left for school before he was awake, worked the late shift, um, and he got home after I was asleep, so I knew that I always want to be very involved in my daughter's life and never miss a recital and never miss a play and take her to the playground and, and all the simple things. And I knew that there had to be kind of another way. Uh, and so that's why wholesaling was so appealing to me. You know, it wasn't just about the money. I mean, it was about the money, uh, but also just that freedom, you know. And so if you're contemplating quitting or is this going to work for me, uh, maybe you've been at it for a while. I just really want to encourage you to take a second and really think about why you're doing this because, you know, when your why is really strong, the how just kind of follows. And so it's really by the grace of God that I randomly stumbled across this business. And as a story we could save for a whole nother time, right? Um, but, I, you know, I looked into all kinds of stuff. And as far as I know, this only business where you can start with, with pretty much nothing and really bootstrap your business uh, and make a significant amount of money in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, my first deal, I mean, I did without spending a penny. And, uh, you know, you want to trade Bitcoin, you got to buy some Bitcoin, man. You want to trade stocks, you got to buy some stocks. You want to start a franchise, you can have a good half a mil before the, the first customer walks in the door, right? Um, 
So you know, the cool thing is here, once you do one deal, a single deal, you have a little money to invest back into your business and then you could do it again and again and each time it becomes a little bit easier. Um, so this is the beginning part where you, know, you don't have much money or time or knowledge or, or probably a combination of those. Um, and this is really the part where most people struggle and a lot of people quit. And it's just because you don't know exactly what to do, you know? Um, one more quick story before I give you the to-do items is I remember when I first got started, right? I made some We Buy Houses flyers and I printed them on my grandma's computer. I didn't have a car at the time, so I remember I, I went to my aunt's house and I borrowed my little cousin's bicycle. He's probably like 14 at the time. Hadn't ridden it, tires were flat, and had to walk this thing like a good mile to the gas station to get some air. Uh, and then I rode maybe, you know, five, six miles down. I remember Lake Worth Road. I started putting out these flyers. And granted, I put them in people's mailboxes, which I now know is a federal offense, so don't do that. Um, and later I learned that I was actually in a pretty dangerous neighborhood. And this was good and not good because, you know, good because I was taking action, not so good because I wasn't taking the right action. Um, and also, I don't know if you know Florida rain, but um, I remember the next day taking that same bike ride as I would do for many days, getting caught in this downpour. And I mean, soaked, head to toe, my book bag was soaked, all my flyers were ruined. Um, and I had taped all these flyers to bus stops. And I got my first call from the code violation guys who were less than friendly. Um, and so I was there soaked, all my stuff ruined, and I had to go back and take all of them down. Um, and it was very discouraging. So I, I can completely relate. Um, and while you might be a little bit smarter than taping flyers to a bus stop, um, you might still be doing some version of the wrong thing where you have the right idea, but the execution is just a little bit off. And so the point that I want to make here and thing I always tell my students is that, you know, there is an initial barrier to entry in this business, but that you should really be, great, be grateful for it because if it was super easy, everyone would do it and it just wouldn't be profitable. Um, so I learned a lot of stuff the hard way. Uh, I don't want you to get arrested or robbed or have code enforcement called on you. Uh, so hopefully I can um, kind of shorten the learning curve here. Um, but one thing I realized is that in trying to teach this stuff, I don't really talk about my beginning that much. And uh, it's kind of my fault. Um, but I do want you to know, like, I've been there, man. Like, this, this did damage my relationship. There were arguments about money, about me wasting my time, uh, about not being a good partner or you know, about not being a good dad, you know, stuff like that. And while my family is very supportive, um, they weren't support of, of me personally. They weren't supportive of the business. And so what are you doing? Uh, this is not going to work. It's a scam. And, and, you know, all these different things. Um, and so I want you to know that, um, you know, when I talk about these things, you can be confident in knowing that, no, I didn't have the dad just give me, like, a bunch of money to start the business. And so when I tell you uh, some of the specific things, you can be confident that some of this stuff works, right? Um, so first of all, uh, I won't spend too much time on this because I can talk about this forever because, like I said, I want to get some of the tangible stuff. So really quickly, I just, I just really want to stress the importance of education, man. You need to take a fast from regular media, no TV, no radio. Make sure you become obsessed with learning this stuff. Podcasts, YouTube videos, you got my channel, other people's channels, audiobooks. Every time you drive, you know, the two hours you would normally watch TV, learn the business. Um, on that note, you don't need to learn everything to start taking action. You know, once you get that paralysis analysis, but still, the more you know, the better. Um, also, on a similar note, any naysayers, skeptical people, negative people, personally, I would cut them off ruthlessly and unapologetically. Um, but understand they're family members, spouses sometimes, so take with a grain of salt. Uh, but you really got to spend less time with those people. Um, so now is the time where we'll kind of jump into this. Uh, you might want to take some notes if you aren't. Pause this, maybe grab some pen and paper, and um, we'll get started with the first step, which is going to be to collect intel. Now, when I say this, this isn't something you want to spend weeks on. You can literally do this in one evening. The few hours that you spend on this step will save you months of work in the future and will prevent you from spending time and marketing dollars that don't convert. Um, so I have some videos on my YouTube channel called How to Determine a Target Market, Part 1 and Part 2. Just go and watch those videos and repeat those steps. Um, that's going to tell you what you should be looking for and where you should be looking. Um, side note, in one of those videos, I am uh, <clears throat> using one of the cash buyer's letters that I sell to pull data from. That's not the point that I'm trying to make here. You don't need to buy that. Um, as a matter of fact, don't, don't buy that because we're starting from the bottom, right? Um, but I don't want you to overcomplicate this. Just use Google, man. It's freaking easy. Go to Trulia.com. Look at their heat maps. Look where the most properties were sold. 
um, look how much they sold for. You want to kind of aim to be in the median range. So you don't want to be in the war zones, but you don't want to start, at least at first, in very expensive areas. So for me, I do most of my business. It's going to be concrete blocks, single family homes, not in gated communities with zero to low HOA in the $70,000 to $250,000 range. Um, next, I want you to realize Google is your friend, man. Go to Google, type in wholesale deals, and type in the name of your city. Then I want you to go to every wholesaler's um, website and sign up for their buyers list. Then I want you to monitor their inventory. See which deals are getting emailed out multiple times, coming back five days in a row, meaning low demand. See which ones go out and are gone within 24 hours. Um, call the wholesalers. Ask if they're available. Keep track of this stuff. Have an Excel sheet or a Google spreadsheet since we're doing this for free. Um, also, look for other signs in your neighborhood. Look for bandit signs. Look for pawn shops. I mean, you're essentially a pawn shop for houses. You're buying below market price because of a seller's circumstance and then selling for a higher price. Um, next, I want you to focus on your relationship building. Go to meetup.com, search RIA, and start attending local real estate meetings. Start talking to investors and buyers. You talk to them, ask them where they're buying, ask them about their last deal, ask them what they're looking for. Pay attention to other wholesalers and the presentations that they make, all right? Um, now for the spending. Let's say you got a, a few hundred bucks to spend, right? This, this is what I would spend it on. Um, matter of fact, getting ahead of myself here, let me bring it back for a second, right? The first thing you want to do is look for deals. Not, not too profound advice here, but, but hear me out for a second. I feel like we just lost some people. Um, there are deals all around. Right? Some of you guys might have seen the um, sales video I made for my wholesaling scripts that I was promoting a little while back. And basically, a part of the video is me showing you statistics to prove to you that regardless of the market, um, there are deals all around you. Uh, and there always will be. So I show some statistics and, and um, show how many foreclosures happen daily, how many people get divorced daily, how many people lose their jobs, how many people pass away and properties get inherited, how many evictions. And part of that is to really install the belief in you that deals exist. But here's the problem, right? You have to manage your RAS. Now, if you're not familiar, your RAS is your reticular activating system. So it's like a network of neurons located in your brain stem, and there's a ton of tangible science that you can look up if you want on how this stuff works. But the easiest way for me to describe it is like this. It's basically a filter, or if you can imagine like a bouncer outside of a nightclub for your brain. Um, it makes sure that your brain doesn't have to deal with more information than it can handle, and it plays a big role in screening all the sensory information that you perceive daily. So you might be familiar with this exercise, it's popular in a lot of seminars where the speaker will say, hey, uh, look for everything red in this room. Whoever finds the most red things wins a prize, you know, and they give you like a minute and they say, look for red, look for red, look for red. And then you close your eyes and then they ask you to name everything that was blue. And if it's your first time doing the exercise, most people can't do this. And that's your RAS in action. So basically you won't see what you aren't looking for. And so that's the point that I'm making here is that we have some like, like 60,000 thoughts in a day, right? And most of those thoughts are unconscious. And then a large majority of your, you know, conscious thoughts or, you know, your other thoughts are basically just scanning for danger to make sure you survive, right? So you need to actively um, train your brain to consciously look for deals, which brings me to driving for dollars, right? So in the very beginning, you don't want to overextend yourself too much financially. This is a business that truly should pay for itself. Um, so start smart, right? The only thing I would spend money on initially is gas money and your cell phone. I know these are simple, uh, but those really are the first things. You know, a lot of people looking for the fancy software. It's going to bring them deals. Uh, it's just not how it works, man. It's like a diet or people losing weight, you know. It's the people that change their lifestyle and create new eating habits and build a foundation and eliminate bad habits and commit to exercising for the long term. And they make the plan to lose the weight, you know. And the people who are just looking for that magic diet pill, that shit just never works, man. Um, so when you're driving, you're going to be looking for signs of distressed or vacant properties. So things like tarps on the roof, high grass, trash in the yard. And this goes back to the RAS thing, man. If you're driving through a neighborhood at 30 miles an hour, you're not going to see the lock boxes on the door. You're not going to see other wholesalers' bandit signs. You aren't going to see the sheriff's notice on the door. You aren't going to realize that there aren't blinds in the windows and that there's no furniture in the house, you know? Um, personally, if I were starting all over again, I would drive for Uber or Lyft. So that way I could make money while I'm driving for dollars. Uh, you know, let the business fuel my business, right? Um, <clears throat> so step one was to gather intel. Step two was network with other real estate investors. And, and people in general, man, like everyone should know that you buy houses. A lot of you might be familiar with the concept six degrees of separation, where you can connect any two people in the whole world in six or less intermediaries. 
And there were some updated studies like Cornell and then Facebook uh, did a study analysis like 1.9 billion users to show that that number is actually closer to three people. Meaning that we know that there are people who need to sell their house. And there's a good chance that if you just ask someone, you know, they'll know someone who knows someone who needs to sell. But you got to put yourself out there. Um, so then step three was to drive for dollars, right? And if you want to know what that looks like in more detail, I have a video on my YouTube channel where I am driving for dollars in real time. I'll show you some examples on what to look for. So check that out. Um, so just start by compiling a list of addresses when you're driving. Uh, when you get home, type in the name of your county and the words property appraiser or tax assessor. You're going to be able to find the owner and their mailing address. Um, it's typically a very good sign if the mailing address is different from the property address, meaning that the person doesn't live there. Um, and then from there, you can either send them some direct mail to the owner's mailing address. And if you're on that, um, that low budget, you know, go get paper stamps and envelopes from like a Walmart or something and just send the mail yourself. Um, just be sure that you keep track of the data because here's the thing um, with direct mail, right? You can get a deal from the very first letter you send or it can be the thousandth letter. Um, there really is some randomness to the game. Uh, I actually got lucky. The first mail campaign I ever did was a probate list and I got, it was my second deal and I got it from the first round of a mailer, which is, I only spent maybe like a hundred bucks on. But if you want your results to be consistent and predictable, you want to mail to the same list a minimum of six times. Um, another option is to do some skip tracing and call those numbers. Uh, but again, if you're at the point where you have someone, you, you can do that. But if you don't, get creative. And again, Google can be your friend. You would be surprised at how much info you can find just by Google searching, man. You can find phone numbers on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, I've had people's resumes pop up with, with their contact information on it. Uh, take advantage of free trials. Be creative. You know, as an entrepreneur, you are a problem solver. Um, and with some of these free sites, like, uh, like Spokio or whatever, it's not going to work all the time. Probably won't even work half of the time, but it doesn't have to. And that's another thing I love about this business. You can have 100 leads and 99 of them could suck. It just be duds. Um, but you just need that one. If you flip that one and you make $10,000, you can put that profit back into your business. And now from that one deal, you can have eight or $9,000 to spend on your marketing. And imagine doing that 10 times. It just multiplies exponentially. And that's why the first deal is usually the hardest. Um, also, on the note of being creative, talk to other wholesalers. They're not competitors. They're collaborators. Um, they might have resources. They might split a skip trace with you, the cost. Um, they might pay you for your list of leads initially. If they have deals, call. Ask if you can JV with them. Um, go to work. You can post their deals on free sites like Craigslist. That's how I did my very first deal, right? Um, so next, this is going to be probably my favorite and what I recommend to most of my students who come to me with very little or no money. And that is to snatch deals off the MLS. Uh, people say there aren't deals in the MLS. Dude, I do them all the time. But here's the thing. A lot of your marketing, paid marketing, you're looking for motivated sellers, the people motivated by circumstance like divorce or foreclosure, right? Now, you can find those on the MLS, but instead, I recommend you look for properties with signs of physical distress. See, I made this meme on my Instagram page, but it's basically to let people know the uglier, the better. That's where the money is. It's in fixing up the properties. Uh, also, those houses don't qualify for traditional loans. So there's less competition. Um, now, some people will say they don't have MLS access. Bro, you got Zillow. It's MLS access. They pull from multiple systems. Um, and there's a function that lets you search by keyword. So you want to search for words like water damage, vacant, needs, you know, fill in the blank, TLC, mold, handyman, Chinese drywall, motivated. Again, get creative. Um, you can set up auto searches that will send you an email anytime a property um, that has any of those words in the description comes in, it will send you an email. And then you just call and make an offer. This is literally a technique that you can do with no money. And yes, some of these will have strict requirements and you won't be able to, you know, they won't work. But again, you just need one. So if you want to see this in action, you know, what to say on the phone, how to make the offer. Uh, I got some videos on my YouTube channel for that that will kind of walk you through this. And I'll probably post some more um, in the future. I feel like you guys kind of like those. Um, but for now, check out the one, how I made 10K in 23 hours with no money. And how to wholesale with no money live example. Um, so recap one more time. First, educate. Um, two, market research. Three, network. Four, do JV deals. Five, drive for dollars. And six, find distressed properties on the MLS. But we're not done. Uh, I got a few more recommendations and some pointers for putting this stuff into action. So again, I want to stress that you absolutely can do deals with zero money. 
I've done it. I have students who do it all the time. But if you do have some spending money, it will be faster and easier. So back when I was freaking broke as hell, I read a book by Dave Ramsey called The Total Money Makeover. You might have heard of it, right? Um, there were some really good things in the book um, that I took and that I liked. And some major things that just didn't resonate at all. So stuff like all debt being bad. I mean, I just disagree. Debt on liabilities is dumb. It's bad. But if you're using debt as an asset where you can measure a return, then I think it's okay. Personal opinion. Um, but the main thing is that he talks a lot about budgeting. Um, and I thought for someone on a fixed income, it makes perfect sense. But for me personally, there's just no way I'm going to limit myself. I'm just going to focus on how to make more money. Money is abundant. They print trillions of this stuff, right? Um, I'm not going to eat an unhealthy, you know, I'm not going to eat unhealthy food because a $1 hamburger fits into my budget better than some grass-fed organic bison or something good, right? I don't believe in living a lifestyle based on lack and frugality, but for a season when you're first starting out, I would focus first on cutting any unnecessary expenses. I would advocate living frugally. Uh, save some money. It'll make your life easier. And don't think things like, I don't have $1,000. Think how can I make $1,000? Um, in, in one of my previous videos, I said, you know, if someone offered you a Lamborghini for $1,000, you'd find a way to pay for it. Work some overtime, find jobs on Craigslist, drive for Uber, sell a bunch of shit on eBay, um, use a credit card, borrow from family and friends. Uh, again, be, get creative. And uh, I'm saying that because when you can afford to spend about $200 a month, the first thing I would invest in is a CRM or customer relations management system. Uh, basically, it's a system that keeps track of everything you do, all your leads, all your offers, what you need to offer on, um, what you need to follow up on. An organization like that will take you a long way. Now, if you can't afford it now, just use Excel or Google Spreadsheets. But, you know, when you can, it's a worthwhile investment. And, you know, people ask me for recommendations on this stuff. Personally, I use a program called Reifax. Um, it isn't available in all states. And, you know, I haven't used them all, so I can't say. Again, just use Google. Look for some recommendations. Um, I can also vouch for a program called FreedomSoft I used in the past. That's very good. Um, and understand with all these programs, they're not going to do the work for you despite the way they might be advertised, but they can really, really help you. Um, most of them do basically the same things, but one feature that not all of them have that I believe is critical is a system where you can fill in a template one time and have a system that autofills and sends bulk offers on your behalf. I mean, you can import or um, look up multiple properties, say 50 properties at a time, and at the click of a button, you can have all your contracts written up and delivered uh, in like a minute or two. Uh, might be a bit hard to visualize, so I'm gonna cut to my screen and show you what that looks like. Okay guys, so really quickly, I just wanna show you a little bit of the CRM. This is not a full demo by any means, but uh, I wanna show you what functionality you might wanna be looking for and that I highly recommend in your CRM of choice. Uh, so again, this is inside of Reifax. This is what I use. And remember, the primary function of any good CRM is simply a place to keep all of your offers and leads combined. Within this system, I have hundreds and hundreds of offers. If you're trying to keep track of that stuff in your head, it's gonna be near impossible. So the cool thing about this, every property that I make an offer on, there is a history. So I know how much I made the offer for, when I made the offer, what date, their timestamps and this system is also integrated with my email um, so anytime I send an email or make a phone call you can also add notes in there it will show you what was said you know if I made the offer and then they made the counter offer I can see those things if I sent an email if I just click on a property for example it will show me the full history what emails were sent back and forth so you can follow up appropriately set reminders and things like that um, so that's the primary focus, but there's one functionality that I wanted to show you that I highly recommend you look for in whatever CRM you do choose. So again, we're here at the home screen. You can see that I can search for properties within this system, which is pretty cool. Just some criteria here, public record. You can search for sale, for rent, for sale by owner, foreclosures. Uh, mortgage information is pretty cool. That's stuff people pay a lot of money on, say, a source like list source for. Uh, but here you can just get the, um, you know, the estimated equity of properties uh, included in the system and then you can find probates and stuff like that as well. Uh, but I want to show you the offer making system. Uh, also, like I said, Reifax is in a limited uh, amount of states right now. So right now we have uh, California, Florida, Maryland, New Jersey, but I do know that they want to take this system um, nationwide, which is pretty cool because they're, they're very good about accepting feedback 
and uh, always trying to improve the system. But really quickly as an example, this is how this works. So you can set up a lot of different templates because you're going to be making the same types of offers and having the same communication with different people over and over. And so to save time, you don't wanna have to write the same text message or the same email multiple times. So you can set all that stuff up in here. Um, the main one I wanna show you is that you can do the same for your actual offers that you're gonna be sending and contracts, right? So we go to settings here, these are different documents. Uh, here's an example we're going to edit this contract and so this is the florida uh, purchase and sales agreement and as you can see the variables are updated you, know, you can see like the property address this stuff gets auto filled i'll show you how this works in just a second but you can see offer price deposit balance acceptance date closing date things like that right so once you have that set up you can go back and search for properties uh, another very cool thing about this system is that if something's listed on the MLS, it will automatically pull in the contact information of the agent, including their email address, so you can just email the offer. It saves a lot of time. Uh, if you're dealing directly with sellers or you have to find this stuff, you can also manually put it into the system and or you know, import it. Uh, so anyway, once you search, and you can search by a lot of different criteria, you can see, for example, the listing price, you can search specific cities or zip codes, you can search by the uh, value based on the comps, you can search for um, active and potential equity, stuff like that. Once you do that, you will add it to your follow-up system. Now, within my follow-up system, I have hundreds and hundreds of offers. What I have pulled up here, I have it filtered for some dummy uh, dummy properties because you know so I can send tests or have sent tests to myself in the past so contact is typically where the seller's name would be or the listing agent if it's a listed property you can see obviously I put myself here uh, like I said these are just test um, addresses so what you would do here the contact comes in automatically and then you would um, you see the list price here and then you would just type in your offer price so for here let's say I wanted to make a hundred thousand uh, dollars as the offer so you would do that and then here you could click and then what do we have I, I think nine properties here and then it's so it's as simple as this right so you just come up here and click docs and then here you have all the different templates I told you about a moment ago so we'll put this one here and then you can also attach other things like if there's an addendum or lead pay, uh, based paint disclosure or something like that you want to put a proof of funds it's optional but you can add it in here and then this is where you put some of those variables so the property address and stuff like that will be automatically populated you know individually per contract and then you can put you know the deposit amount the acceptance date so let's say we want to make this february 16th uh, how many inspection days let's say 14 days and then you want to put the closing date right and this will be put on each individual contract and then it's a simple you know you click that if you want to see a preview you can and then if you want to just email it you just hit this email button and then again it'll pop up with like all the different email templates that you can write which basically just says hey my name is so and so maybe you want to say I'm a real estate investor and I want to buy your property so you do that and then uh, we'll wait for this to load just a second okay and then you can just select a template of all the different you know options that you have that you can write yourself and then you just want to hit send doc and then when you do that as you can see here uh, process zero at this time but it'll process all nine of them and basically it will email all of those to the specific contact so as you can see I made nine written offers signed ready to go in a matter of minutes so that's something that's really helpful that can really just save you a lot of time uh, again, if you guys do want to use Reifax, if you're in a state where they support it, you can use my discount code. It's 4409. It'll save you about 50 bucks a month. Um, and then if you're not, that's something, you know, a lot of these CRMs do that. So you can just look for that in the demo or on their website. Uh, one I have used in the past is FreedomSoft. They have something called the OfferBot. Uh, basically does the same thing. But again, this works very well for me. So I haven't tried all of these different things, but they are out there. Um, so that's just something that you would want to look for that I highly recommend and on that note I think we can jump back into the rest of the video uh, now here's an important takeaway right it doesn't matter how many people you talk to how many phone calls you make how many houses you um, you know go see if you aren't making offers you have to make written offers daily if you aren't writing up contracts and sending them you're just spinning your wheels right um, next is very important is the follow-up man most of my deals don't happen when I make the initial offer, but they come from the follow-up. And I mean like obsessive and regular follow-up, right? Most deals are made on the 8th to 12th contact, and less than half of all wholesalers follow up more than once. It's just a huge competitive advantage you have there, and that's where a CRM will really keep you on track. Like if you're just making five offers, it's easier to follow up. If you're making 100 or 200, 
can be a lot harder to keep track of those things, right? So if I had to give you the formula, it's basically you need frequency, volume, lots of volume, speed, follow-up, and consistency to make this work. And consistency being really the most important. You know, I have a lot of students that come in very excited and they say stuff like, I'm going to make a thousand offers in a day. And it sounds good, it sounds impressive, but chances are, number one, you won't. Uh, if you do, it's going to be overwhelming. You're not going to follow up on any of them. And you haven't built the processes and the habits. It's like someone who wants to build a bigger chest and they say, I'm going to do a thousand push-ups today. Sounds like a lot, sounds good, but number one, you're probably not going to do it. And then you're going to get either fatigued, burnt out, or injured. Uh, and you're just not going to see results from that massive effort. Instead, you want to be the person who says, you know, I'm going to do 10 push-ups every day for one week, then 20 push-ups every day for the next week, then 30 every day for the third week. And then despite the increasing volume, every day and week, the push-ups seem easier and you'll see greater results in your strength and physique. So again, I want to reiterate another analogy um, and a few more things before we close. Uh, it's basically like a video game. And yes, I'm a video game nerd. Uh, Mortal Kombat 11, favorite franchise, coming soon. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But when you start out in these games, right, you don't have much. You have a very small part of the map. You have the little wooden sword and shield. And then as you play, you open up parts of the map. You upgrade your skills and your weapons. If you're playing GTA, you go from broke to flying helicopters and shooting rocket launchers at your Lamborghinis for fun. You know, my point is it's a process. So don't try and do all this stuff in the beginning. You want to pick one or two strategies and go narrow and deep. It's like digging for gold. If you dug two feet across every inch of the U.S., you would work very hard. You might be even in the right areas, but you will never hit gold. You'll just be really busy. If you do your homework, talk to miners, learn where previous gold was located, study geography, you know, and then based on your research, you go out, you choose one target area where it's likely to be, and you dig deep, you will hit it. And so that's what you want to do. You want to be working very narrow and deep. Um, one last thing too, I want to mention here, I'm a huge Gary Vee fan. I've read all his books. I listen to his content regularly. And if you're a Gary fan like I am, you know that he preaches this lifestyle of hustle. And here's why I want to diverge a little bit. Um, I'm not in this business to work, work, work. I really want to enjoy my life. Um, I don't think hard work is always directly correlated with the highest levels of potential and success. Uh, I'm sure we all know people who work hard as hell, but are broke. You got people living in third world countries. You got guys picking fruit for 18 hours a day who work hard but barely, barely make enough to buy food. Um, and I think the most successfully financial people are people who leverage other people's time, money, resources, knowledge. Um, and so I don't want you to obsess over working 24-7, but I think it's appropriate for a season. So if you're just getting started, man, work your ass off. Work like a maniac. Hustle. Make sacrifices. Work weekends. And know that it's just for a season. When you do level up, you'll be able to leverage other people's resources and the game will get easier and more enjoyable. And, you know, I am that work in progress and uh, I'm excited to share, share this journey with you guys. You know, the ups and downs and successes and failures and all these different things as I go along. But I promise you, if you stick with it, the beginning is the hardest and then you decide your level of hustle. You know, it does get easier. Um, so kind of, kind of out of time here, man. This is a little bit longer than I thought it would be. Uh, but if you're interested in learning some more on this subject, I'm actually going to, I want to invite you to a replay of my last webinar. Um, in that presentation, I go a little deeper into, you know, where you should start and at what stage. And I work with you through some of the math, show you how many calls you should make before you expect a deal, um, how much you should have before you start a direct mail campaign, depending on which one, how to stack lists to increase conversion rates, um, talk about what I call internal and external inventory to determine what the types of strategies are best for you based on your specific situation and market. Uh, and then I walk you through some actual deals that I've done and a few case studies from some of my students. Uh, this was an, a live invite only webinar. Um, I get a page where I post my replays. I leave them up and then pull them down when it's time to post my next webinar or next video that I kind of like. Uh, but if you're interested, I'm going to put the link in the description here. You can go check it out. And um, it's like the last one here before it'll get pulled down, or, like I said, replaced with whatever future topic I talk about. But this specific one um, builds on some of the things that we talked about in this video here. So if you're in a similar predicament or stage in your wholesaling journey, um, you definitely want to check that one out before it gets replaced. Um, other than that, I hope you guys found this helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments section or um, send me a DM on Instagram. I can't get to all of them, but I do try my best to answer those as, you know, answer as many as I can. Um, and if you like the video, please check out the other ones I recommended here. And do consider subscribing and maybe hit me with some likes, man. 
Um, also, remember, this was a question from my survey page. So if you'd like me to answer your question in my next video, I'll leave a link to that page as well. You can leave me your question. Um, and you can also download my ebook on finding uh, motivated sellers for free. Um, and hopefully your question will be the one that I answer in my next video. So that's my time, folks. I love you all. Thank you so much for the support. And I will see you on the next video. Peace.